So, uh, Dr. Murphy, I'm really excited to have you share your information today with folks. So please welcome to the show. Well, Dr. Ingalls, thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm honored to be on here. I love your work. And, uh, you know, it's unfortunately, but still today, there's many practitioners who don't believe that fibromyalgia is a real thing. And, and those that do, and there's, you know, the few that do, really don't know how to treat it. They don't really understand it. So it's a really unfortunate situation for those who have fibromyalgia. It's very frustrating. So, you know, talk us through a little bit, you know, what are... <laughs> there goes my Australian Shepherd. He's a wonderful <laughs> guard dog. You're not going to sneak up on my house. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's okay. Well, why don't you just talk us through a little bit about, you know, what is fibromyalgia? I mean, how would somebody know if this is what they, they have? Well, so fibromyalgia is a syndrome. So a syndrome are a group of symptoms that people have in common, and then we give it a name. People are probably familiar with irritable bowel syndrome bloating, gas, indigestion, loose bowel movements, constipation. Fibromyalgia is a syndrome made up of common symptoms of diffuse, achy, sometimes disabling pain, fatigue, brain fog, restless leg syndrome, insomnia. These are the common symptoms that we see in fibromyalgia. It's important to point out, though, is, is the way that you and I practice in functional medicine and is that you know, fibromyalgia is just really just a name. That, that's all it is. It doesn't cause the pain. It doesn't cause the insomnia or the brain fog. Uh, and what we want to try to do is look for the underlying causes of fibromyalgia. Yeah. So what are some of the symptoms that people experience beyond just sort of that body pain? Well, that's the, you know, that's the number one, obviously, is this diffuse, achy pain that, that people have. And again, it's, it's a different type of pain than maybe you and I would have you know, being a, uh, a weekend athlete or, you know, working out in the garden. I mean, this is the kind of pain that, you know, can make it difficult literally to get out of bed that day. Or, or maybe you're going to choose one activity for the day because after you've done that activity, you're in so much pain. That's it. You can't, you know, you can't go any further. But it can be a very long list of, of uh, symptoms like Lyme disease, something that you specialize in. And, and a lot of doctors dismiss the, the patient because they think there's no way they could have all these symptoms. But along with the pain and the fatigue and the insomnia and the brain fog and the irritable bowel and the restless leg syndrome, oftentimes they're depressed. And of course, you know, who wouldn't be depressed if you had an illness that very few understood and there's very little out there in the conventional medical world that can help it. Uh, so depression is, is oftentimes a, a, a symptoms associated with fibromyalgia. Anxiety is also another one, but they can have all sorts of things. You can have fibromyalgia along with, heaven forbid, Lyme disease. Uh, you can have uh, you can have fibromyalgia and rheumatoid arthritis or lupus. Or uh, so the list can be rather long, and um, it, it's a, it's an illness that affects primarily women. About ninety eight percent of those who have fibromyalgia are women between the age of of uh, uh, forty and, and seventy. And it affects about eight to 10% of the adult population around the world. So why do you think there's that disposition towards women? Great question. Wish I had a simple answer. Uh, doing this for 22 years, specializing in fibromyalgia, worked with thousands of patients. Obviously, the majority of them are females. I mean, you look to female hormones, right? So you think, uh, okay, well, it's probably going to be estrogen or it's probably going to be progesterone. Something's off there. That can be an issue, but it's so far downstream for me that, you know, what I see oftentimes is that uh, integrative practitioners or functional practitioners who maybe don't specialize in fibromyalgia, but they, you know, take these medical misfit patients and they want to put them on hormone replacement therapy. There's a place for that, no doubt, but I think that's way downstream. There's other things that are much more uh, effective and helpful dramatically so than hormone replacement therapy. So it's got to be something other than estrogen and progesterone because that's something that's been tried multiple times and that's not it. it you know, uh, uh, autoimmune disease. Um, you know, we don't fight, we don't have the smoking gun yet, but we have this, we have the smoke. I mean, we think there, there's, there's something to this where the body is attacking itself like an autoimmune disease. And women, as, as you know, are the ones that primarily have autoimmune disease, I kind of am leaning finally <laughs> after two decades of saying, no, it can't be autoimmune disease. We're not seeing it in the, the blood work. You know, we see small fiber neuropathy and some of the other, other things. But now what we're starting to see is the research is actually starting to point that maybe it's an autoimmune disease 
where the body is actually attacking the nervous system. So we know it's a neuro hormonal, so nerves and hormones, something there's a disconnect there. But, but now we're starting to see maybe, maybe it's the body has, for whatever reason, got out of rhythm and it's attacking itself and creating this, this, uh, this whole thing called fibromyalgia. Yeah, it's interesting you talk about this autoimmune piece, because I think, you know, when we think about autoimmune disease, we think about things like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis that, you know, they got these blood markers that are not necessarily definitive, but they certainly, again, point the smoking gun at certain things where you might see someone has a positive ANA or a rheumatoid factor or something on paper that kind of says, yes, we can see this autoimmune process happening. But I know when I was doing research, you know, looking at Lyme disease, we've got evidence that Lyme causes, you know, this autoimmune problem where it attacks the white matter of the brain or the gray matter of the brain or your peripheral nerves, but there's no commercial blood test that measures that. So, you know, we as practitioners, you know, we can't send you to Quest or LabCorp and say, okay, just run this blood test. And that's going to tell us, yes, this is what you have. So it sounds like same thing with fibromyalgia is that if that's what's going on, we just don't really have a commercial test to measure that, right? Well, there is a test. There's a lot of debate. And so it hasn't been fully accepted. It's called the capital F, capital M, little a test, FMA test. And, and those of you who have fibromyalgia, you can look that up, Google it. It, it didn't used to be covered by insurance. I think it's now starting to be recognized by some insurance carriers and you can get reimbursed for it. Uh, but there is some, some controversy about, about that test. It's really a matter or process of elimination. So it's not unusual for somebody with fibromyalgia to have to go to a dozen different doctors over half a dozen years till they finally get the diagnosis of fibromyalgia. And, uh, you know, it's oftentimes it's, it's the last, you know, what, what else are we going to call it, right? It's, and so, we're, we're, you know, we don't know what you got, but we're going to call it fibromyalgia. Here's some drugs. Good luck. You know, it's kind of one of those things, unfortunately. Well, you and I both practice root cause medicine. You know, what's been your experience? You know, what are you seeing, again, as sort of the common root causes of why people have fibromyalgia? Well, this is, I think, the case for most every illness out there and it's stress. So I, I really feel like, you know, the two driving the, uh, the components of, of chronic illness are stress and inflammation, you know, and, uh, you know, people hear, oh, uh, my fibromyalgia is brought on str for stress. I'm not, I don't feel stressed. But if you really dive deep into it, you see that at some point, uh, oftentimes there was a straw that broke the camel's back. And what I see in my practice over the last 22 years of working with these individuals is that oftentimes they come from a very challenging childhood. And that could have been a toxic, you know, it could have been a toxic environment. It could have been abuse. Uh, it could have been that they had an illness when they were young that whether, you know, Epstein-Barr or something that, you know, really was stressful time for them. And they lose that plasticity to stress. So as they go through life, something comes along that, again, is the straw that breaks the camel's back. It could be hysterectomy, some type of surgery. It could be a divorce. It could be a toxic work environment. It could be just something as um, routine is going off to college and trying to navigate this whole new world that they're, you know, they've been dumped in. Uh, but once that stress starts to affect the hypothalamus, the pituitaries and the adrenals, the HPA axis, which is really the self-regulating systems of the body, once that becomes dysfunctional, and we see that is classic fibromyalgia, that the hypothalamus, this bundle of nerves in the brain for whatever reason is not communicating like it's supposed to with the rest of the body, then the different systems that it controls, which is virtually almost every system in the body, starts to have something go, go awry, which then triggers symptoms or warning signs in that, in that individual. Yeah, I'm glad you talked about this trauma piece because, again, I, I've been practicing for 23 years and I see a lot with my Lyme patients. It's very similar circumstances where there's this unresolved trauma and it can be big T or little T, but, you know, if that doesn't get addressed, it's really hard for the body to be more resilient. And uh, it's also the one thing I see most practitioners really don't know how to address or don't really address it properly. But you know, I've had people that take the pills and they do the manual therapy and they do the drugs and, and they do all these things. And you know, maybe they make a little bit of headway, but they don't really quite get over the hump. And yeah. so often it's that trauma piece that, that seems to be the sticking point. And uh, do you have particular ways that you've helped people kind of deal with trauma? Is that something you do in your own practice or do you refer them out to someone who specializes in that? 
Well, what I try to do is, you know, I think that, uh, that, you know, if stress is the catalyst, you know, we all have stress and certainly trauma is stress. It's another, you know, another name for stress, but you know, what I look at is what can we do to reduce our stress? And uh, sometimes we're in an environment, you know, we, we, there's nothing really we can do. We're at the mercy of that, of that, that stressful situation. But what we can do is start to arm ourselves uh, with depleted nutrients that we need to handle that stress. And we can do things like I talk about, I encourage all my patients to do an hour of power every day. And if you can't do an hour, you do half an hour, but that's where, you know, you meditate and you pray and you have that quiet time. You read positive material, uh, deep breathing exercises, maybe a little bit of stretching, but it's that time that you really nurture yourself to help to reduce that stress. I'm really big on breathing exercises. Uh, so that's something I really share with my patients that they can do throughout the day, these little exercises, because uh, what we know with fibromyalgia is that nervous system, the autonomic nervous system is on overload and the autonomic nervous system is, is, on, uh, is you know, it, it, it's the driver. And these individuals, that nervous system is, is ramped up. So everything is magnified. Any kind of stimulation is magnified. Bright lights, loud noises, changes in the weather, things that you and I wouldn't think anything about for these individuals, you know, just thinking about going to the store to shop can set them off into this thing called a fibro flare. So um, I use this analogy and, you know, uh, that we're all born with a stress coping savings account. And in that stress coping savings account, we have chemicals that allow us to deal with everyday stress. So we have cortisol and DHEA and, uh, and then we have things like norepinephrine and dopamine and, and serotonin, we have these chem and, 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 and vitamins and minerals. I mean, panathenic acid, which is the anti-stress vitamin and magnesium. And we use those anytime we're under stress, real or imagined. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be real, you know? Uh, but if we're not careful, we can overtax that. We can bankrupt that stress coping savings account. And one of the ways that this happens for fibromyalgia is they lose the ability to get deep restored to sleep and one of the things they deplete, Darren, is serotonin, the happy hormone. Right. That, when that happens, we start to see uh, all sorts of symptoms that we associate with fibromyalgia start to show up. To, so that's, that's really where you start. To me, if you can't get that individual getting deep restorative sleep on a consistent basis, you're never going to be able to get them to the next level of what needs to happen. So that is step one, is restoring deep restorative sleep. Yeah. Do you have specific strategies to help people get a better sleep? Because I know for some people, it's I can't fall asleep. Some people I wake up in the night and other people, it's a little bit of both. So do you have maybe like a top two or three things that yeah. work really well for folks? Yeah. Let me share my sleep protocol. So, you know, along with sleep hygiene, which we don't really have a whole lot of time to go into, but that's super important. Make sure you're turning down the lights as it gets dark outside, turning off electronics, you know, an hour or two before bed. Um, in your bedroom should be for intimacy or to read a book, relax. Uh, shouldn't, you shouldn't have your computer in there. You shouldn't be working in there. You shouldn't be watching TV in there. All the things that we, you know, a lot, a lot of us do to self sabotage our, our sleep. But uh, for fibromyalgia, the key is serotonin. So this brain chemical serotonin. And what, what I find is once I can get that serotonin level back up and it, it, that helps with their deep, the, the deep sleep. So what, what we know is this, is that when they bankrupt their stress coping savings account and they get deficient in serotonin, they have more pain because the higher your serotonin level, the higher your pain threshold. Uh, serotonin blocks a hormone called substance P. Right. And what we see is serotonin level goes down, substance P goes up and your pain threshold goes down. So little things that may not have bothered them years ago, uh, a handshake, a hug, uh, light touch can set them off, you know, in intense pain. And it's because they've got this low pain threshold. Um, as we, as we raise serotonin level, we see that pain threshold goes up and pain goes down. So, um, five HTP, five hydroxytryptophan is an over the counter amino acid. Uh, you should be getting that in your diet when you eat protein foods. So amino acids make up proteins and, uh, there's 20 of them. Uh, nine of them are essential. I hope I, I always mess that up, but I think it's not. I, always, I don't know why I have a block about that, but nine of them are essential, which means you have to get them in your diet 
because your body can't make them. The other, they, you can make them, but these amino acids turn into hormones that the body needs to run correctly. Um, tryptophan, people are probably familiar with tryptophan because you know you associate that with eating a lot of turkey and getting sleepy and you know, uh, but tryptophan should turn into 5-hydroxytryptophan and then that 5-hydroxytryptophan combined with B vitamins, magnesium and vitamin C that turns into serotonin. And unfortunately for those with fibromyalgia, oftentimes they have a genetic glitch, just the way God made them. They can't turn that tryptophan into 5-hydroxytryptophan. They have a block in this chironeurin uh, pathway. They can't, they, they can't make that, that, that work. And so they develop this serotonin deficiency um, and, 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 you know, oftentimes, of course, with fibromyalgia, one of the two, one of the three uh, FDA approved drugs for it or, or, or two of them are antidepressants, but no one has an antidepressant deficiency. Um, yeah. You know, if you're taking Savella, which is a serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, and you don't have any serotonin, you've depleted that, uh, it's not going to do anything. It's like using a gasoline additive in an empty gasoline tank. And that's what we see with fibromyalgia. So what I get them to do is to start with 100 milligrams of 5-HTP 30 minutes before bed with a little bit of grape juice to initiate uh, glucose, get that glucose in there. And then insulin comes along, another hormone that then will pull it past the blood brain barrier. And what we see is uh, that 5-HTP increases their natural sleep hormone melatonin by 200%. So we're doing two things. We're getting that serotonin level up. And by doing that, we raise the pain threshold, pain goes down. By getting them on the 5-HTP, we get the sleep hormone melatonin to go up. So we're helping them get into a deeper, more uh, productive uh, rebuilding type of sleep. Um, the higher your serotonin level, the less anxious you are, the less depressed you are, the less likely you are to have irritable bowel syndrome, a very common thing we see in fibromyalgia you have more serotonin receptors in your intestinal tract than you do in your brain. So when you get nervous, you get, you know, you get butterflies in your stomach, not your brain. Uh, so getting them that serotonin level built back up and restoring deep restorative sleep, Darren, is the first step. You got to get that right. You got to get that right. Absolutely. Well, you mentioned the HPA abs uh, access. Can you talk a little bit about how important are your adrenal glands in modulating fibromyalgia? Because again, when people are stressed, you talked a little bit about cortisol, this big stress hormone, but how is that translating to what's going on with, with fibro? Great question. Perfect. Leading into the next segue. That's awesome. So years ago, when I started treating fibromyalgia, 22 years ago, I had my first patient and I, uh, she came in, her name was Sheila Jones. And I didn't know anything about fibromyalgia. I was just doing functional medicine and I was able to get Sheila Jones well in three months. Now, <laughs> yeah, I quickly learned they're not all that easy. Um, and so, you know, don't, don't turn the interview off. Don't turn this off, you know, because uh, it's not that easy, but for her, for whatever reason, and I think maybe it, it was because fibromyalgia chose me. I didn't choose it that I at least thought, okay, well, this is gonna be easy. And, and, and of course, back then, as you probably know, there wasn't a lot known about it. And I started getting all these referrals from the medical community. And I would lay up wake at night and literally think, oh my gosh, what am I gonna do with these people? Do they have a brain cancer? Do they have this? Do they have that? This was long before I really figured out what are the key components, the underlying triggers for fibromyalgia that, you know, the root causes that you and I treat. But this is what I came up with uh, within the first few years of begging, borrowing, stealing from everybody that was having any kind of success in these, you know, finding and fixing these symptoms. Uh, I came up with this thing called the jumpstart protocols, deep restorative sleep. Now, once we get them sleeping, because many of these individuals haven't slept well in years and haven't felt well in years, once they start sleeping better, they have less pain. Uh, when, when you, if you're not getting deep restorative sleep, not only is your pain threshold low, because of low serotonin, which increase your inflammatory chemicals by 40%. But once they started sleeping, they felt better and they would go do things that they hadn't been able to do in, in years. I mean, they go grocery shopping, they go out with friends, they try to work in a garden, but then they would crash for three, four or five days. Right. And what I realized 
that that was the adrenal fatigue. That was the, you know, the part that I need to work on next. And your adrenal glands or your stress coping glands. So not only have they bankrupted their stress coping savings account, they have bankrupted their stress coping glands to the point they had no stamina, no resistance to stress. Any stressor could set them off. So uh, when I had my medical practice for a number of years, I had a very large medical practice here on the campus of Brookwood Hospital. And at that time, when I had five medical doctors to kind of kind of boss around, uh, we used Cortef. Yep. And we put them on, you know, we'd put them on low doses of Cortef, uh, 20 milligrams a day spread out through the day. I, when I sold my practice, though, I couldn't, I didn't have access to, ha you know, asking someone to please write this person a prescription medication and uh, with these protocols. So I just started using over-the-counter glandulars, adrenal cortex glandulars. But by fixing this adrenal fatigue, now they started to have more stamina and resilience to stress and they could do more without having these flares. So that was part, that was part two. Yeah, I, I think it's important for listeners to understand that, you know, what you and I talk about adrenal fatigue is kind of dismissed in the endocrinology community. You know, when people have adrenal problems in their world, these are people that are like their adrenals don't work at all. And like any other, you know, hormone system or body, there's a gradation of it works great, it doesn't work at all, and everything in between. Yeah. So what we're talking about is sort of a dysfunctional, you know, cortisol level, and not that you don't make it at all. In fact, when we do blood levels or salivary levels of cortisol, we'll see that some is there, but we may find that the rhythm of cortisol is off or that it's being produced at the wrong time or too much, yeah. you know, later in the day instead of earlier in the day. So again, if you've been to your doctor and they've said, oh no, that adrenal fatigue is a bunch of nonsense uh it's really i think just a different interpretation of how we're looking at your lab values and assessing your your cortisol well in conventional medicine you know this so well there, it's black and white so yeah. either you have a pathology or you don't but you and i in the world that we work in we're looking at optimal function we want we want that individual systems to be at optimal levels so if someone goes and they get a their blood drawn early fat you know fasting glucose um cortisol level and it's the the and it, the the uh, numbers are uh anything below five you're in trouble and anything uh, over 19 you're in trouble but there are six and the, and the the doctor he or she says well you know you're you're in the normal range but you know what we're we're as different on the inside as we're on the outside so for a six for that person that can be that they have you know they actually have addison's disease you know they really they 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 need to be on steroids um, and, and, and who wants to be a D student anyway, you know, I mean, if you're down at the bottom, right, if you're at the bottom, everybody wants to be, to be a B, at least a B, you know, I mean, or at least average, but you want your body to work the systems to work as most effective as they can. And so that's what we're always looking at. When we look at, uh, blood work or any kind of labs we're looking, we want the optimal numbers, right? Absolutely. You know, I, I know, you know, in getting root cause medicine, we always talk about the importance of food, you know, food is medicine. Are there things that you find people with fibromyalgia really should not be eating or things that they really specifically should be eating? Yeah, so you, you can't drug your way out of fibromyalgia. And this, you know, the thing that's happened, Darren, is that over the last uh, decade or so, physicians in the conventional world have come to an erroneous conclusion that you just have to learn to live with fibromyalgia. And they tell patients that because what they see is the common drugs prescribed for fibromyalgia, whether it's antidepressants or Lyrica, uh, gabapentin, Gorillus, uh, that, that sleep medications, whatever it is, they don't work, at least not long-term. And they oftentimes, more than not, create more problems. And so they know this, they see that, and they, they, don't, they, they don't have any answers. So they tell the person, you just have to learn to live with it. The only way, the only way that you can overcome fibromyalgia, and you can, I mean, I've got uh, hundreds, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of testimonials, uh, not to be braggadocious, but to say that you can do it, you can do it. And, but the only way you can do it is you got to get healthy. And that sounds so simplistic. I know, I know it sounds so simple, but it's actually pretty complicated in that we're, we've got to find the root causes. You know, where do you, where do you start? And, but to get healthy, you have to eat healthy. I really, you know, we hear this thing that you are what you eat. And I really believe that over, over a lifetime, you know, the, the foods that you eat, the things that you take inside 
create health or not. And, but, but that's the long game, right? That's the long game. It, I think a keto diet, low sugar diet, low carb diet is best for these individuals. I test all my patients for food allergies because that could be a trigger for their pain or their fatigue or their de depression or what irritable bowel, whatever it is. Um, but I really, uh, part of the jumpstart protocols are, are uh, sleep, adrenal fatigue, and then number three would be finding anything that's wrong in the GI system because it's, it, it is what you eat, but it's also what you absorb or don't absorb. So if you're trying to, and I work with a lot of patients that are eating, I hate to say it, uh, healthier than I am sometimes, and yet they're so sick and, and find out that they have uh, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or leaky gut or yeast overgrowth or you know, but, you know, something that's causing them to not to be able to absorb the nutrients that they're eating and that's creating all kinds of problems like shows up if it is irritable bowel. So I think it's really important that we take care of that. And, and, and I recommend all my patients to start with something easy, like a digestive enzyme to make sure that they're breaking down the food they eat and the supplements that they take and they're absorbing those and getting, getting the, the benefit of it. It's funny. I think any of us that have written a book on chronic disease, I know you've got a great book, uh, Treating and Beating Fibromyalgia and Chronic Fatigue Syndrome. And I've got my book, The Lyme Solution. And I've read Terry Wall's book and Amy Meyer's book. And I think we're all saying the same thing. It's like, you got to eat good food. You got to get good sleep. You got to take care of the terrain because all of this is ultimately what leads to better health. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, like I said, it's, it's simple in nature. It ultimately, it ends up being very complex because we're all unique individuals. We've got our, our genetics, our epigenetic expression to deal with. We've got our environmental exposures to contend with, but I like that you've got a message that there is a path to getting well. Absolutely. And so the last part of the jumpstart, and this is not the end all be all for sure. As you know, you treat a lot of complicated patients, but it's the foundation you know, if you don't get this right, you're just, you know, you're really just guessing, you're struggling. Uh, so the, the number four part of the, of the jumpstart protocol is you got to saturate their cells with high doses, but the right doses are combinations of vitamins, minerals, amino acids, and essential fatty acids that they're, they're deficient in. And uh, when I had the medical practice, we did Myers cocktails. So we did high dose uh, IV therapy, but that wasn't practical for, you know, someone to travel three, four hours right. uh, from out of town to come see us from the Southeast and then get that, you know, be there three hours and then come back every week. It wasn't practical. So I developed some, some nutritional formulas to help with that. But, but it really is important that they take these high doses and saturate the cells. And I say that because so many people have, you know, bought into Centrum Silver and a one a day and, <laughs> you know, these things. And they think that that's going to actually do something. And, you know, those, those supplements are based on the RDA, you know, recommended dietary allowance, which I actually, you know, so outdated is 60, 70, 80 years out of date. I call it the recommended disease allowance. Yeah. It's just enough to keep you from getting berry, berry or scurvy. Right. right. But it's not going to give those cells the nutrients they need to make those hormones that you need for the body to work correctly. So, you know, my patients are taking sometimes a thousand times stronger than the RDA for like things like panathenic acid or uh, thiamine or B2, or, you know, some of these B vitamins. Um, they're water soluble. You flush them out if you don't need them. But again, we're different on the inside. You know, so what one person can take, uh, 200 milligrams of magnesium and be in the bathroom all day. You know, you know, that's all I can take. Another person, I may, they may be up to a thousand milligrams of this natural muscle relaxer, this mineral called magnesium that's so important in 300 bodily processes. Uh, so I really believe you got to get, a, get, get these individuals on a really good multivitamin that saturates those cells and gives them those building blocks they need for the for the uh, for them to be able to make the hormones and the enzymes and everything that they need for them to be healthy. Yeah, well, I like you meant I like that you mentioned about the RDA because again, I agree, it's the bare minimum to survive. That doesn't tell you what's optimal. And again, if you're someone who's ill, your need, your demand may be much greater than the average person who just might take something to stay healthy. 
uh, yeah. if your body's utilizing a specific nutrient faster than you can take it in, or if you've got absorption issues, that's going to leave you with a relative deficit. So, you know, when you see I'm taking a thousand or two thousand percent of the RDI, I get people that panic, like, oh my gosh, you're, you're trying to kill me. I'm like, no, it's like that yeah. the RDI is such a small amount. They said yeah. that's just the bare minimum to survive. That's not necessarily what's optimal for you. And fortunately, most of what we use in the nutraceutical world is generally regarded as safe, although there are some nutrients and herbs that have toxicity. I mean, in my clinical practice, I have rarely, rarely come across anyone that got even close to a dose that would can be considered toxic. So that's a pretty unusual circumstance, I think. Well, so I practice this thing as a combination of orthomolecular medicine, you're probably familiar with that, and, uh, and um, that term coined by Linus Pauling, but they've done studies, they've looked back over the last 40 years, there's never been a death from vitamins or minerals. Now, there have been some instances, you know, with, with stimulating herbals, you know, we've seen that, but even those are really rare when you put it in, in, in the context of what is it is now, the number one, two, or maybe even the third cause, maybe from being kind of death in the United States is, is, is due to drugs, uh, prescription drugs. And, and it's not to, you know, to step on anybody's toes. It's just saying that, you know, the kind of what uh, Jeffrey Bland uh, the father of functional medicine says we practice good medicine and the, you know we try to do everything naturally and the reason why we try to do that is number one we're treating the root causes and number two we have this big window of safety to work in once you start to add these foreign substances which you know prescription medications the body doesn't know what that is you can have all sorts of side effects is there a time and place for those things absolutely but in the fibromyalgia community you're never going to overcome fibromyalgia with just drug therapy alone. Yeah, I find with uh, my fibro patients that have been to whatever specialist they've seen, you know, it's drug bingo. You know, we're gonna try Lyrica today. Okay, that didn't work. Then we're gonna try necessary. Okay, that didn't work. And it'll just keep cycling through, you know, various drugs and, you know, see if one happens to make you feel a little bit better, but knowing that it's not really getting to the root cause. And look, yeah. sometimes, you know, if you're really suffering, you need a stop gap just to make you comfortable while, you know, we're working on these underlying issues, but just kind of go into it knowing that that's, if you're on medication or you need medication, that it doesn't have to stop there. There's just so much more you can do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, you, you, you know, in conventional medicine, it's about treating symptoms. And so, you know, with a fibromyalgia you got, patient, you got so many symptoms. So before you know it, if you're not careful, you get on the medical merry-go-round and you're seeing these different, you know, you're seeing a, a rheumatologist, you're seeing, an, you're seeing, maybe seeing a psychiatrist, you're seeing a GI doctor. And before you know it, you're on, you know, you're on a drug to put you to sleep, a drug to wake you up. A drug to speed you up, a drug to slow you down. You know, you're on half a dozen drugs to a dozen drugs. Uh, that's that's not uncommon in this community, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It's uh, it gets to be the merry-go-round, and we love to help people get off the merry-go-round and get to firmly rooted in uh, the roots of functional medicine, the roots of you know good health. And I'm always uh, amazed at how well people do when, again, they just start eating good food, getting good sleep, all the things you just talked about. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, before we close out, I want to mention you've got a great summit coming up uh, specifically about fibromyalgia, and I'd love you to share some information with our listeners about it. Yeah. So, you know, it, whether you have fibromyalgia or not, I want to encourage you to kind of check out because it, this, this summit, it's a free online summit, May 16th to the May 22nd. So there'll be, uh, there's, I think there's 40 interviews, uh, expert interviews that, I, that I've conducted with these people all over the world. And there's probably something for everybody because with fibromyalgia, it's, it's uh, you know, you're looking for, as we talked about these root causes. So for one person with fibromyalgia, obviously, you know, I mentioned the jumpstart protocols, but also find that with fibromyalgia, as you're peeling away this, this onion of dysfunction, you're peeling away these different layers to keep getting them back, you know, getting them back to health. Uh, I find about 70% of my patients have something, a, a problem with their thyroid that's ever not been diagnosed properly because they're not testing properly or they're not being treated properly. So we have experts on talking about thyroid. We have experts talking about uh, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is an autoimmune thyroid disease. We have uh, experts talking about mold because that can keep you in this sickness pattern. We have experts on Lyme. Uh, we have experts 
talking about uh, leaky gut and food allergies. And it's, it's, it's all sorts of things that oftentimes are maybe not in the conventional medical conversation, but need to be. And, uh, but I, I'd love for you to, for your audience to, to, to check out the summit again, May 16th through May 22nd. Fantastic. So we're going to drop the link in the show notes. So you guys can just click on the link and register. Again, it's free. You're going to get a lot of great information from Dr. Murphy and all of the guests that he's invited. So definitely want to check it out. And if folks want to work with you directly, how can they best get in touch with you? Well, I want to, you know, I encourage you. We got a lot of free material like you do. You got a wonderful website, Darren, and uh, we give a lot of stuff away free. Uh, a lot of videos, a lot of there's podcasts, we have blogs, and that's at your fibrodoctor.com your fibrodoctor.com absolutely amazing thank you so much i really appreciate you sharing all your information with fibromyalgia with our listeners today i know you guys got a lot of great information so again check out the free summit coming up and if you're interested in working with dr murphy he's gave you the website again we'll drop the link in the show notes for that as well so again roger thank you so much for joining me today darren thank you this has been fun i thoroughly enjoyed it all right thanks